how to begin the Christian life. Of course, beginnings are all important. <clears throat> and most Christian lives today aren't begun too well, it seems. And when there's a poor beginning, there's usually a slow development. So it's very essential for us to begin well if we are to follow on uh, in a healthy manner and grow in the Lord. It's always a great relief to find out and to realize that we begin the Christian life in the realm of grace just as we entered the Christian life, as we were born again by grace, as we entered into that which God did for us in His Son, by receiving His Son, it's on the same basis that we are to live the Christian life from beginning to end. And of course, there is no end. It goes right on into eternity. But our birth and our Life, our Christian birth and our Christian life and our Christian service is all of grace, all done by God for us. And when we're first uh, Christians, when we're new Christians, uh, just born again, uh, babes in Christ, as the Word says, uh, we're aware of the new life within, and we're we feel strong. We feel uh, we're full of love for the Lord, and we're full of joy and peace and happiness. And we want everyone else to know about the Christian life, and uh, it all seems very glorious, and it is. So what it usually happens is we set out to conquer the world and to win all of our friends and to do great things for the Lord and to be <clears throat> great and mighty Christians. Well, it isn't too long before the Lord shows us that even though we are born again, we can't live a Christian life, and we're not supposed to that we were uh, born into the Lord Jesus that he might be our life and that he might live the life through us and that we are branches in the true vine. And the Lord Jesus, Jesus is the vine and he'll live his life in and through us as we abide in him, as we rest in him, as we look to him and as we fellowship with him. That's our part. And his part is to manifest himself in and through us as our Christian life. Now we remember that uh, <clears throat> in our justification we were saved by grace. We were justified by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was the just one and that we took him as our righteousness. We took him as our justification before God. And God accepts the Lord Jesus and he accepts us in the Lord Jesus. In Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're redeemed, we're paid for by the Lord Jesus' death on the cross. He paid for our sins. He was the last Adam, the perfect last Adam going down into death, uh, paying for our sins. The wages of sin is death, and the Lord Jesus died that death. And we took him as our Redeemer, as our Savior, and received the benefit of his death and of his life. Paul says in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And he's saying that if we could be righteous by keeping the law and by doing things, then uh, there was no use for the Lord Jesus dying for us. And if we were to gain righteousness by law, then the Lord Jesus died in vain. But he didn't die in vain. He alone could pay he alone is the Savior. So by trusting Him, we do not frustrate the grace of God. We enter into it. And that's how we were born again, by grace. By grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of works, God says. But the big thing for the new Christian is to realize that he lives the Christian life by grace also. He's born by grace. He's born again by grace. But then he is uh, he lives on the same basis. That's a wonderful thing to see. 
a very important thing to see, too. It's going to save us a lot of struggle, a lot of effort, and a lot of useless frustration if we learn from the outset that the Christian life is lived by grace. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And God uh, placed us in Christ when we believe. He created us new, new creations in Christ. And He has a walk all laid out for us, stretching out ahead in our Christian life. And He's ordained certain things. And as we grow and as we go along in our Christian life, we'll be walking in the path that God has already laid out for us. God knows the beginning from the end. And uh, as we look to Him, our Christian life unfolds. We don't have to figure it out. We don't have to plan it. We don't have to work it out. We keep our eyes on Him. We learn the fellowship of the Lord Jesus. And He takes us along. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask to think, according to the power that worketh in us. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the power of God. And he, His life works in us as Christians. And He expresses Himself through us as we grow. And uh, God will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask to think. Uh, because He's given us His Son. And He is going to manifest Himself and through us. And then in uh, 2 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. And uh, Paul is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, manifested in and through us uh, by God. God will do it. And he'll cause us to triumph in Christ. We don't triumph in ourselves. We usually fail in ourselves and uh, are defeated. But we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus and depend upon him for our Christian life. And there's triumph. So then there's uh, peace and uh, progress. And we move ahead and grow. And in the realm of service, as we reach out to others and seek to witness and to share, or whatever God gives us to do as we uh, grow in the Christian life, we're going to find out that our service is by grace also. In Second Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And God is going to uh, give us all that we need for all that he calls us to. That we'll always have all sufficiency in all things. And that we won't just uh, struggle along and just barely make the grade, but we'll abound. We'll abound in every good work. There'll be enough. There'll be enough for us and enough for others. The Lord Jesus Christ is adequate. That we're going to find out as we as he takes us along. And in uh, Philippians two thirteen, uh, yes, Philippians two thirteen, Paul writes, "For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure." God works in the Christian's heart in his life. And God's good pleasure, God's main purpose for saving us, is that the Lord Jesus might be manifested in and through us, that others might see him, and that we might realize that the Christian life is not I, but Christ. That's his good pleasure. That his Son might be glorified in all things. That his Son might be our very life, our very Christian life. And it's God working in us, both the will and the do of His good pleasure. So as we look to Him, He will do. First Corinthians 15:10, God says, 
Uh, Paul says that his grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. So the way grace works in the Christian is that uh, it isn't the Christian just lies down and becomes inactive and doesn't do anything, but that he's depending upon another source, a source other than his own. He's depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ as his Christian life. And uh, the Christian is a, a very active individual and he's living for others. And he's living for the glory of God. But his maintenance, his the source of his life and the maintenance of it is comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the honor and all the glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we live for him. And we allow him to live in and through us. So actually the Christian life is a very busy life, a very active life, and it's a very fruitful life. But it's a restful life. And the Christian uh, rests in Christ and therefore there is a lot accomplished. But if we seek to work for God and do things for Him and uh, all, while we may be extremely busy and wear ourselves out and not get anywhere because all of our activities may be coming from the wrong source. But when the Lord Jesus does something in and through us, there's no effort to it. And uh, there may be a lot of activity, but it will be a restful activity and it will be a fruitful and rewarding activity. And there will be something accomplished for the glory of God. There's a great difference there. And Paul labored more than all the rest, but yet he says it wasn't me, it was the grace of God which was in me. And he, Paul depended upon God. He depended upon the Lord Jesus Christ for them. He said, not I, but Christ. And then we're going to find that uh, His grace extends all through eternity. Uh, in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, that in the ages to come, uh, God might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And God's grace is eternal. And it's not a matter of law, it's not a matter of uh, producing it's a matter of receiving by grace. We receive our life for our new birth. We receive his life. We receive his life for new birth. We receive his life for our Christian daily life. And of course, we have received his eternal life. And his eternal life will take us right on into eternity. It's forever. Eternal life in Christ, all by grace, from beginning on through eternity. Well, we must, at the outset here, we must speak about this subject of assurance. It's a very important subject. It's not only important for the new Christian, it's, been, it's important for Christians who have been along the path for a long ways. Uh, there are some Christians who have gone along and they aren't too sure. They aren't too sure whether or not they're really saved. And this can be a very crippling thing for them if they aren't sure that they that they have salvation in Christ, that they're justified, that they're born again. The assurance of salvation, a very important thing. And that is the after a Christian is born again, this assurance of his must be established. Uh, it's the same in the natural realm. A child who might not, he may think, he may have heard rumors or something that he uh, is an, was an orphan and that he has been adopted, but never told about it by his foster parents. And he may begin to doubt that these folks are his parents. Well, he's lost his assurance. He's not sure. And this can do a tremendous thing to the individual in this realm. And how uh, strengthening and settling it is when we're sure who our parents are, for instance. That uh, dad is my, really my dad and mom is really my mom. 
and not someone else's, or that I, I was someone else's. The assurance of our position in the family, the assurance of our birth, of who we came from. Well, it's exactly the same thing in the Christian life. And uh, a real assurance comes from the Word of God. That's where our assurance is established. It's a matter of position. Which family are we in? Well, we saw on the other side of the tape that it was a matter of coming into God's family by faith, forsaking Adam's family, the human fallen race, and stepping into the spiritual eternal race uh, of which the Lord Jesus is the head and the source. We were born into Christ, born again. Now, the only way we can be sure of that is because of what the Bible says, that when we take the Lord Jesus Christ, we become new creatures in Him, new creations in Him, and that we have, He that hath the Son has life, that we have this position in Him, that we're placed in Him by faith. That's our position. Now, our condition, when we first begin the Christian life, we, in many realms of our life, we may not manifest much of the Christian life. We may not seem to be Christians. We may not feel like Christians in many, in many times during the day, in our condition. Well, then we have to go back to our position and say, well, the Word of God, the eternal Word of God, which never changes, says that my position is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I know that I'm saved because of what the Word says and not how I might be feeling at one time or another. I do not go by my condition. I go by my position. Well, these two realms are important to learn, and we're going to learn something about them. About them. Position and condition, they're not to be mixed up. Position is eternal and it never changes, the Christian position. The Christian condition is, is uh, very changeable. It changes every day. And there is a growth and a progress about it, a development, because condition comes from position. Condition is the result of position. Position is the source, and condition springs from our position. Our position has to do with our birth and our life, our, our, uh, our family in the kingdom of God, the family of God, as children of God. That's our position. And our condition has to do with our experience and the expression of that life as we grow. The former never changes, but the latter, the, our condition changes constantly. Uh, an example is this. Say that a boy, a uh, certain boy, his father's name is uh, O'Reilly. And let's say that his mother's maiden name was O'Hulahan. Well, there's no question when we know about his parenthood, there's no question but that this boy is Irish positionally. As far as his position goes, he's an Irish, he's an Irish boy. And uh, because of that position, because of that nature, uh, we know very well that uh, as he grows up, he's going to be Irish in his condition and in his daily mannerisms. His condition is going to reflect his position. He was born into that position. He grows in his condition. So we see the difference here. Now I'll take this uh, illustration and turn it around. <clears throat> Say we have a boy who, uh, as we observe him, he seems to be quite Irish in his condition and his actions. He seems to act like an Irish boy. But uh, <clears throat> let's say his father's name is uh, Carloni, and that his mother's maiden name was uh, is Valentino. Well, now we're not going to be fooled by his condition, are we? No matter how Irish he acts, we know because of his parenthood, we know because of his position, that he's Italian. He's an Itai. 
and condition can never be changed as far as the human family birth the position can never be changed and we cannot be fooled about that position by watching someone's condition we always go by the position everything is settled in the realm of position and that of course is true in our Christian life now uh, what about our justification when we were born again we chose against our Adam first Adam position we became aware of our of being in the wrong position because of our condition sinful and that we became convicted of our sin and we uh, became sick and tired of our old life and we became possibly afraid of the consequences of sin and we finally came to realize that we were in the wrong family we had the wrong position we were in the fallen Adamic race born of our parents and we were born sinners because of Adam fallen Adam so that we finally saw that the Lord Jesus Christ was the last Adam he was the new Adam he was God's Adam and that he was our Savior and we forsook our human position and we stepped over by faith into the Lord Jesus Christ we received him and received his position we took a new position by faith and we were born again we were born into Christ and his nature became our nature we, we received a new nature the Lord Jesus Christ came into our hearts and we have a new position before God we exercise repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ we, we, we turn from our old way we turn to God and we trusted the Lord Jesus we turned from our natural Adam position and we took the Lord Jesus Christ as our last Adam position as our personal Savior and we were recreated in him we were given a new and eternal position we became members of a new spiritual eternal race if any man be in Christ he's a new creation God says and then we think of this um, in the verses in 1st John God says this is the record that God has given unto us eternal life and this life is in his Son he that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and of course God has written his word there's the record the word of God and he's written the word in such a way that we can know that we have eternal life we can have the assurance of our salvation by realizing that the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal life himself he is life I am the way the truth and the life he has told us and no man cometh unto the Father but by me so when we receive the Lord Jesus we receive eternal life we received him as eternal life so the word that's what the word says and there's our assurance we go by what the word says that's the record and of course we enter into our position instantly and it, it has nothing to do with feeling it's not something that's felt it's the same when we were born naturally we entered into the Smith or the Stanford family or whatever it was instantly the, one, the instant we were born we were in that family we had that, that name and it wasn't a matter of experience it was a matter of position now in entering the Christian life and entering Christ it, it's not experience it's simply a changing of position by faith sure it may have a great effect upon our condition we may uh, become extremely happy in the Lord and uh, full of love and peace and joy 
that's the reaction. That is the result of our position. That has to do with our condition. But our position is entered into instantly, and uh, it has nothing to do with our senses, our feelings. It happens deep within. The, the Lord Jesus brings, he comes in himself, he brings eternal life in because he's eternal life. And we're united to him as a branch to the vine. It's a matter of birth. So it happens instantly. We become sons of God. Then our daily condition, our Christian growth, goes on all during this life and all through our eternity. We, can, we continue to grow. But that is simply the result of our position. So there is a basis for our assurance. The fact that we're saved is, is, is what does the Word say? And uh, now we must mention the fact that almost all new Christians in this area of the assurance of their salvation, this is the first realm, uh, this, this is where they make their first major mistake in their Christian life. And it's through this mistake that they learn their first wonderful lesson in the Christian life. You see, God always teaches us by, He teaches us very practically, He teaches us uh, how to do something by first how not to do it. He mainly teaches us through failure. And uh, much of the Christian life is full of failure. But that's the very basis of our growth. We learn uh, to do things by first doing them our way and doing them wrong, and then we find out God's way. It's really the same in uh, baseball or any anything like that, that as a good ball player is the one who learned by uh, much of his, much through failure. And Ty Cobb used to say that uh, you learn more about baseball through losing a game than you do through winning one. And it's much the same in the Christian life. Now this first real mistake that the Christian makes is this. He enters his new position by faith. He takes the Lord Jesus Christ and he's born again. As his Savior and he's born again. And usually... This has a wonderful effect on the new Christian. It always should have, but some, some folks uh, it doesn't. But usually there's a great initial change in the life. Uh, many of the old things drop off and there's new things manifested in his life. He becomes a joyous, happy Christian. New first uh, love and enthusiasm. Tremendous change. Well, <clears throat> this young Christian... He, he's so aware of the Lord Jesus and he's so aware of his new life and he's so aware of the change in his life and things are so different and so real and so tangible, so wonderful, that quietly and imperceptibly, down underneath, what's happening to him is that he's shifting his faith concerning his assurance. He's shifting that faith from the Word of God over to, from his position, he's shifting it over to his condition. He feels so saved and he acts so saved and he, he, everything's so wonderful that he's beginning to rely upon his condition for his assurance. Well, I, I, I seem to be such a Christian that, well, I know I'm a Christian now because I, look at me. And he shifted his faith for assurance from his position in Christ to his condition in himself. A, a new young Christian, this easily happens. His faith for assurance has shifted from the scriptural facts to his tangible, tangible personal feelings. And now he, he knows he's saved because he feels saved. That so often happens to a young Christian. And he hasn't realized that what he's done or what he's allowed to happen. But then here's what happens. <clears throat> One morning, 
the dawn comes. And on this particular day, the Christian wakes up, young Christian, he'll wake up, <clears throat> and he realizes, he finds out that he, uh, he doesn't look very saved, he doesn't feel so saved, and so he doesn't sound very saved either. And all day long, everything and everybody goes wrong. <clears throat> and by nightfall, he finds himself at the end of his ascent. He's saying, well, my condition is pretty bad. And so I guess I'm not a Christian after all. And he's thoroughly shaken up. And he makes up his mind that night, well, tomorrow's going to be different. We'll, we'll rectify this tomorrow. So the next day, he very, in a determined way, he strives to look and to feel and to sound said. He's beginning to struggle to uh, maintain his assurance. Uh, but because he's centering his uh, faith upon his condition, there's nothing but failure. And he, his assurance doesn't stand up. His, his relationship to God, his salvation hasn't changed but his assurance of it has. He's not so sure now. And the only reason this whole thing happens is because he shifts his faith for assurance from position to condition. And this is the first thing that God would teach us as young Christians, is that the Christian life from beginning to end and the Christian service all springs from our position and is all of grace. So when this happens to the young Christian, he falls down and he becomes very upset. And uh, maybe God will allow this to go on for some time. But any, at any rate, sooner or later, but the Lord will, uh, he'll, he'll cause a Christian friend to uh, help this young Christian. And of course, the, the older Christian friend will realize what's happened. And he'll show him what he's done, that he's going by a condition instead of position. And he'll help him to turn his faith and his heart back to his position by means of the word turning back to the Word of God. And uh, then, of course, the young Christian faith for his assurance of his salvation will begin, will be again established on the solid rock, Christ Jesus, by the Word. He'll be, he will have taken his position again concerning his assurance. He didn't lose his position for his salvation, but he, he, he lost the assurance of it. So when his assurance, assurance is reestablished in his position, then, because he's abiding in the Word again, he's going by the Word now, then his condition begins to improve because uh, he's looking to the Lord Jesus, he's depending upon the Lord Jesus, and that, that, that has an effect upon his condition. And he, he begins to improve as a, as a Christian. As his eyes are upon the Lord Jesus, that, 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 affects, that affects his daily condition. But when he takes his eyes off the Lord Jesus and begins to look at his condition, whether good or bad, uh, things begin to go down. And his Christian life uh, begins to falter in, in his experience. It doesn't falter in, in Christ. There's no change there. But the manifestation of it slows down and uh, becomes weak because his eyes, his attention, and his heart are, have been taken off Christ and are himself. And uh, the life is in Christ, not in us, not in ourselves. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's another factor here about our assurance, which is called the witness of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Spirit. And in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit, assuring us that we are the children of God. Well, many Christians say, well, I, if I only had the witness of the Spirit, I would be sure. 
And they really don't know what they're saying about that, but they, they feel that'd be something extra and that would help them. And it's a temptation to hanker after something more tangible than the positional te testimony of the Word, of the Bible. Uh, the young Christian wants something more tangible than believing in the Word of God. That's usually what happens. He wants to be more sure of his assurance. But uh, what he, he's going to be taught and what he must find out is that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. And he's the one that caused men to write the Bible. The Holy Spirit is actually the author of the Bible. And when he works in our heart and speaks to our heart, he does it by means of the Word. And he doesn't do it in any other way. We have God's revelation now in the Bible. The Bible is God's revelation. It's God's word to us. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, ministers to us by means of the word. So actually, the witness of the Spirit within our spirit, deep within our life, is done by means of the Bible. That as we study the word, and as we believe the word, the Holy Spirit ministers deep within our very being and he gives us a deep abiding inexplicable assurance that cannot be moved that is the witness of the spirit he witnesses to the word in such a way that we not only believe but we know we we are assured once and for all we're forever assured that we're born again because we're resting in the Word of God. And we're resting in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom that Word witnesses to. In Second uh, Timothy 1, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Christian knows whom he has believed, and he's fully persuaded that the Lord Jesus will keep him. He is fully persuaded that he's saved. That is based upon the word of God. Well, <clears throat> there's the assurance of the Christian. There's no other assurance. If the Christian goes by his daily experience, so let's say he gets off to a wonderful start in his Christian life and he just, just becomes a wonderful Christian. Even so, he is not to shift his faith upon his daily experience because actually the very development of a Christian much of it means there's going to be failure and there's going to be a going down in order to God, you see God's way of development is the way up is down with God God works backwards to us always God works paradoxically God takes us down in order to bring us up you see, in, in order to give us life on the cross, he took his son into death. And uh, eternal life comes through death. Well, a human uh, human would never have dreamed of that, and, and the unsaved man can't figure it out and never will. But the Christian understands it. And God does things just the opposite of the way we would. So if we're going to depend upon our daily experience as Christians for our assurance, we're going to get in trouble because uh, much of our experience is going to be failure. So that if we say, well, if I am going by my condition here, I'm failing all the time, well, maybe I'm not a Christian after all, I'm a very poor Christian, and uh, our assurance is going to be up and down and backwards, but not very much forward. We're not going to be sure that way. But as we rest in our eternal position, the Lord Jesus Christ, our assurance is steady and bright, and we rejoice in Him. And we rest in Him even when He has to take us down into failure so that we'll grow. Our, our faith abides clear and strong where our faith is in Him, not in ourselves. And that's, that, there's the Christian who's going to grow and who's going to make progress, the one who holds steady no matter what God takes him through. Positional faith holds, holds the Christian steady. And there's another realm here <clears throat> it's extremely important, one that uh, most Christians today don't know anything about. They're trying to get along without it. And we would share this with you very carefully and briefly here. 
And that is the subject of acceptance. Acceptance with God. Now, positionally, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're fully accepted by God. Because he accepts us in his Son. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our position. He's our righteousness, and God's fully satisfied with him. If we go by our daily life, sometimes we're not going to, in ourselves, be very acceptable at all to God. As a matter of fact, we never really are. So if we go by our experience and go by our condition, we're never going to be sure that God really accepts us. But the way it's going to work is that uh, we go by our condition and, and we're doing fine for God and everything's going along fine, we're making progress, then we're going to say, well, God loves me and God accepts me and he's blessing me. But then when God has to take us down to faith, through failure and in the desert places and uh, we have to uh, see what we're like in ourselves and we, our faith begins to get weak and uh, falter, then we're going to say in our hearts, well, we're going to see pretty much what we're like in ourselves. We're going to say, well, God certainly doesn't love me and he's not blessing me and uh, he seems to be failing me. And so we're not going to feel very accepted. And of course, what's the greatest thing that's, uh, even in amongst worldly people, unsaved people, what's the great thing that damages lives? It's the basic feeling of inferiority, the basic feeling that one is not accepted. That's what's causing all this trouble today amongst uh, the worldly folks, and even Christians. They're not, they do not feel accepted. Well, it's the same way with a Christian about God. It's important that he realizes and is aware that God accepts him as he is. Because God accepts him in Christ. And this gives him a peace and a rest and assurance. And assurance where he's, uh, he, he, he's able to exercise faith in God and uh, dependence upon God. And then God is able to bring him along. So, becoming established in the assurance of our salvation is preparation for becoming established in, the accept in our acceptance to God. Each step prepares us for the next. As we become established in our assurance, we're ready to be established in our acceptance. And then in Ephesians 1, 5-7, God, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will and to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in his beloved son he hath made us accepted in his beloved son there is a statement of the word of god concerning each christian we're not acceptable in ourselves but we're fully accepted in the lord jesus christ we're accepted in our position we don't have to be accepted in our condition. With God, position is everything. And as position becomes everything for us, our condition will begin to line up with our position. Our daily life will become more and more acceptable because we're resting in our positional acceptance. But God does not accept us no matter how good our condition is. He accepts us because we're living in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is our Savior and our very life. That's the basis of our acceptance. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. That's in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our second point to learn. And it's going to take time. All I'm doing here is sharing these facts. It's going to take time for a young Christian to be established in these things. But as he walks in grace and as he depends upon the Word of God, these things are going to be established in his life. And he's going to have a good, firm foundation to go on as he grows. He's going to be assured of his salvation. He is... Fully, he realizes that God fully accepts him in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then, of course, when Satan would point his finger at the young Christian and say, Ah, you notice what's in your heart, you notice how you are in yourself, what kind of a Christian are you? You're not a Christian at all, you don't act like a Christian half the time. What about those thoughts in your heart? What about some of those actions? And the, the Satan is going to point at the Christian. Well, the Christian must learn that his Christian life is not in himself, it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he simply points to the Lord Jesus. And uh, there is my acceptance, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Satan can never question him. He can never touch or accuse the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is where the Christian left. There is where he's accepted. He knows he's not accepted in himself. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, God says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. God has caused us to be born into the Lord Jesus, and we're complete in him. Our life is hid with Christ in God. Christ is now our life. He's the vine, we are the branch. And if Satan sought to touch the branch, he'd be touching the vine. And he can't do that. He can't do that. So the Christian can never argue with Satan, he never has to. All he has to do is point at the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus defeated Satan, and he said to Satan, Satan, get thee behind me. So when the Lord Jesus points to his Savior, Satan has to disappear. Satan has to move on. He cannot question the Christian who hides in Christ. Well, acceptance of the believer, that we realize that we're accepted, fully and eternally accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. That gives Christian a tremendous amount of peace and rest. That's what we need. And we're going to need it as we develop in our Christian life. We're going to re need to realize that God accepts us. And since God does accept us in His Son, since uh, all the sin problem has been dealt with at the cross fully, all the penalty has been paid, God is righteously able to accept us. In Christ, everything has been cleared away. And God, the Holy God, is free to accept the Christian. And he's for us. God is for us. Because he's for Christ. He's accepted us in his beloved Son. And this is what he says in, in Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a design for each Christian and he's able to carry out that design as a Christian looks to him because of what the Lord Jesus has done to clear the way. And of course, God's expected end for every Christian, the design, the purpose that he has in mind is to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. He caused us to be born into him so that the Lord Jesus' nature, his life, can flow out through us, that he'll be seen in us. He, his plan is to make us in the image of his son. Let us make man in our image. And we think of uh, this wonderful two verses in Romans 8, 28 and 29, where Paul says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That God is working everything together for good to the Christian, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. God has predestinated the Christian to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what God is working all things together for, to make us more like him. He's for us, and it's a great comfort to realize that all the things we go through in our Christian life are all geared to make us more like the Lord Jesus. We think of uh, Romans 8, 31 and 33, where Paul writes, If God be for us, who can be against us? And God is for the Christian. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, 
how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, that, that's a logical question, uh, easily answered. God has already given us his best. He's given us his beloved Son on the cross. He, the Lord Jesus died for us. He's given us his best, so it isn't hard for him to give us everything else that we need. And everything else that we need is in Christ. All the purpose of God is centered in the Lord Jesus. And as we learn to rest in Him, that purpose will be carried out. The Lord Jesus will manifest Himself in and through, through us. And Paul says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Well, if God has justified us in Christ, why, why, why should we ever question whether or not we're justified? Why should we even let Satan question us? Or anyone else? If we're resting in Christ, if we've taken Him as our Savior, we realize that He's done the work perfectly at Calvary on the cross, and that we are justified, and that gives us our assurance, that gives us our acceptance. And another thing that it does for us as we rest in Him for our acceptance is it, it keeps us from trying to struggle to, to make ourselves acceptable. We're not, if we try to live a better Christian life, we're going to fail. The better Christian life, the, the real Christian life, comes as we fellowship with the Lord Jesus and as we look to Him and depend upon Him. Then we'll grow. He'll manifest Himself through us. But if we struggle and try to work to be a better Christian, we'll only fail. Now, I'm saying this to you. Maybe you're a brand new Christian and, and it's not going to seem logical to you, but I'll give you six months or a year and... and uh, God will by, by that time God will have shown us through practical experience. But knowing it now is going to be a comfort to you as you go through it. So that realizing that we're accepted in Christ is going to save us from trying to, to produce. And also, it's going to free us from ourselves more that we'll have uh, more freedom to pay attention to the Lord Jesus. If we're all taken up with our own condition and our own uh, problem and uh, taken up with being self-centered, we're not going to... How are we going to concentrate on Him? How are we going to fellowship with Him? We're so miserable about ourselves. But as we realize our position in Christ, we're free to look to Him. We're not we're not self-centered. We're not uh, bothered with ourselves at all. We're rejoicing in the Lord Jesus. And that will take care of ourselves. That will take care of our condition. There's a law of association that goes to work. And that law is that as we pay attention to the Lord Jesus, we become more like Him. That's a law in, in, in the natural realm, even. If you've ever read Hawthorne's story, The Great Stone Face, is a good example of that law in the, in the human realm. And that law works in the, in the spiritual realm. That's the law by which God works. And here's a verse that, that, that brings it out, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, or from experience to experience, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That as we pay attention to the Lord Jesus in the Word, we get to know Him in the Word, we study Him, and fellowship with Him in the Bible. Uh, the Holy Spirit is working deep within our lives, and the life of the Lord Jesus deep within uh, becomes more and more manifest through us. We become more Christ-like because we're paying attention to Him. It says, We're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It doesn't say even as by trying with all our might. It doesn't say with our efforts. It says by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of Christ. He'll do it. Slowly but surely we become Christ-centered instead of self-centered. We grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We grow. And then finally, <clears throat> briefly, we must think for a moment about our eternal security, that every Christian is eternally secure in the Lord Jesus Christ, that there's no question about getting into heaven. We're, 
in Christ we're already there. The center of our life is in the Lord Jesus in heaven. And uh, when we die here, the physical death, we simply close our eyes and instantly we're in, we're in heaven with the Lord Jesus. That's the source of our life. He's the source of our life. He's our position. There's no question about the Christian entering heaven. We're eternally secure in Christ. And uh, there's no long, dark river to cross or anything at all. The Lord Jesus has already closed that gap for us. He is eternal life, and we're born into Him. So as we learn of our assurance of salvation, we learn of our acceptance with God, that is preparation for our learning of our eternal security in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that as we rest in the Lord Jesus and look to Him, the Son of God, we can know that we're secure. When Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, then shall ye also, with Him, be manifested in glory, as a promise. And as we rest in the sovereignty of God, realizing He's God, He's placed us in His Son, in His Son, then we know we're, we're secure. Now unto Him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. It isn't that we don't fall day by day in our stumble and fall in our Christian walk, but we don't fall out of our relationship. We don't fall away from Christ. Many of the falls that we have are part of our development, part of our growth. Many of them are engineered by, engineered by God. It's, it, he keeps us from falling from our relationship. It's impossible for that to happen because we're born into Christ. And we think of this uh, verse in 1 Corinthians 1. He will establish you to the end, keep you steadfast, give you strength, and guarantee you of vindication, that is, be your warrant against all accusation or indictment, so that you will be guiltless and irreproachable in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? How could that be? Because we're in Christ, and He is our guiltlessness. He is our righteousness. We're irreproachable because of Him, and we're accepted in Him. We're not accepted in ourselves. Look at the thief on the cross. What chance did he have to grow? What chance did he have to be a good Christian? What chance did he have to hold out or whatever people think is necessary? No, he, he realized who the Lord Jesus Christ was. He put his faith in Him, and in a few moments he, he was dead on the cross there beside the Lord Jesus, and he was in, in glory. Uh, he was in glory. He was taken to glory. It isn't, uh, we don't have to live to be sure to get to heaven. It isn't the way we live. It's, it's our position. Sure, as we see our position clearly, we're going to live better and better as better Christians, but the final outcome is not going to be predicated upon our condition. It's already based upon our eternal condition in the Lord Jesus. Well, who gets all the glory there? Well, the Lord Jesus does, doesn't he? We can't brag about how good a Christian we are. We know that as we grow in Christ and become better Christians, that uh, we, there's not, we, we can't say, well, I did it, or I did it with his help. We say, no, the Lord Jesus Christ did it all. He did it all at the cross to save me. He's doing it all it's for my Christian life and service. He's already done it all for me to enter heaven. He's my all. So as we rest in the love of God, we know we're secure. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn thee. Well, there, there, there's our eternal security. It's in the Lord Jesus. Payment God cannot twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand, and then at mine. No, God doesn't uh, depend upon us. Or anything about us for our going to heaven. He, he, he settled it all with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's done it all. So we simply rest in Him for our security. And then as we become established in these realms of our assurance and our acceptance and our security, then we become steady, strong, young believers, and God will take us on, and all that He takes us through will hold firm and he'll get his work done. Well, the Lord bless you when you're looking to the Lord Jesus and in your development day by day. If you pay attention to these facts, all will be well and you'll grow. That I can assure you. 
And if you ever would like to contact us, you simply write to Miles J. Stanford, Post Office Box 3035, Colorado Springs, Colorado. The zip code is 80907. And we'd be glad to hear from you at any time. We will send you some literature and help you out if you need help. We advise you what to study, possibly uh, or anything you might, any questions you might have. Feel free to write us. My wife and I are in this work helping young Christians, helping older Christians. We've been in this for over 20 years. And in this type of work for over 20 years, full time. We'd be glad to share with you. We have files here full of literature and material. We'd be glad to uh, share with you. So please feel free to write at any time. Our Father, we thank thee for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.